Welcome in, everybody, to another edition of My Voice Never Sounded Like This When I Was a Baby. This is Sad Times. My name is Kevin. I am your host. For those of you who have never listened to Sad Times before, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Here's a quick primer. Each week we have a kind and generous guest who comes on and talks about times in their life that were difficult, traumatic, times they were upset, angry, any number of things. And the goal is not to diagnose this, nor is it to solve it, nor is it to judge it. It's simply to allow these stories to be told. And some weeks, as we have today, we have an expert who comes on to talk about their particular field. And I'm very excited about today's guest. So we will get to that in just a moment. But if you do know anybody who, in listening to Sad Times, you think might benefit from these stories, we're going to talk today a lot about marginalization and things of that nature. Please send this show to them because there are a myriad of many stories that can be shared with a friend or a family member that you feel might benefit. We believe that often what is discussed on Sad Times are some of the most universal stories in the human experience. Unfortunately, we don't always talk about them day to day. So that's what Sad Times is. We do have a website. It is sadtimespodcast.com. There you can get all of the good old episodes or you can register to be a guest as today's guest did. Before we get to our guest, we of course have to pay the bills. So let's get to our sponsor. This week, Sad Times is brought to you by GERD. What's GERD, you ask? Well, there's a lot of answers to that. A tyrannical genetic curse that looks askew at tomato sauces. A friendly reminder why over-the-hill carts were once so popular for, for 40th birthday parties. Acid reflux. The poster acronym for something called lifestyle changes, or simply good old gastroesophageal reflux disease. That's G-E-R-D. It's R-E-A-L and coming for your good night's sleep. Uh, And that's true. It does not allow you to sleep, Brent. Did you know that? No? Okay. Wade, Wade, put the thumbs away, Wade. Okay. All right. So that is our sponsor. We've paid the bills. Now let's get to, and I'm truly honored uh, to have this week's guest, uh, her name is Dr. Nina Serfolio. Dr. Serfolio, how are you doing? I'm doing great. It's such a pleasure to be here with you today. Oh, it's a pleasure to have you. And I know that we're going to talk, but let's talk right away. Tell us the name of the of your book uh, that will be coming out, I believe, on December the 22nd. Yes, you can pre-order it now on Amazon or Rutledge. The name of it is Psychoanalytic and Spiritual Perspectives on Terrorism desire for destruction. It's sort of a mouthful. <laughs> yeah. Wow. There, There is a lot to unpack there. That's for sure. Um, yeah. And I got the date right, correct? December 22nd? You did indeed. Yes. And we, when we release this, uh, as you're listening at home, the link to order this will be in the show notes uh, so that <clears throat> anybody who is interested in this conversation will be able to go in and pre-order that. So Dr. Sfolio, let's start by tell us where you're from And what exactly are you a doctor of? Yes. So I am from New York, New York. I live in Greenwich Village. Um, I also live up north on the Hudson River in the Hudson Valley. I am a board-certified psychiatrist. My expertise is in trauma, mass shootings, and terrorism. I was in academic medicine for about 10 years. I ran the psychiatric emergency room in the 90s. Uh, Now I'm primarily in private practice and I teach psychiatric residents at Mount Sinai. You ran the psychiatric emergency room? Is that what you said? Yes, I did. Yes. The psychiatric emergency room and walk-in clinic of St. Vincent's in Greenwich Village. Yes. Now, forgive me as a a layman, I'm going to take a a guess here. Is that like if somebody comes in and is having perhaps a psychotic break or perhaps they've attempted to harm themselves? Would that be the type of patients that, yes. that, that, yes. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. Absolutely. Yes. Suicidal, homicidal, psychotic patients, arrested patients, homeless patients that are come in, you know, arrested or emotionally, the police call them emotionally disturbed people. So. Gotcha. That had to have been, you said for 10 years. So that had to have been an extremely challenging job. So that job, I worked about five years. And then, oh, five years. Excuse um, me. Yeah. The other, I was consultation liaison attending at Bellevue, which was similar patient population, actually. But yes, that was a very demanding job. And I actually, I loved it because 
I loved making interventions and helping people right away and seeing them get the help that they needed immediately. So in that sense, it was very rewarding. Oh, I bet. I bet. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I used the term marginalization uh, in the intro. Uh, and when you and I spoke <clears throat> before this recording, I know that marginalization is something that you find a lot in the work that you're doing. And you talked about trauma, the terrorism, and then unfortunately something that is all too prevalent in our society today, which is mass shootings. So when did yeah. you start focusing in on these particular, uh, the terrorism mass shooting um, uh, areas of, ex you know, uh, of mental health and, and all how that affects societies? So that's a fascinating question. I was an elite endurance runner and I ran the Boston Marathon. And then um, I was actually in in Boston during the Boston Marathon, uh, which reverberated back to my work in Chechnya um, because the Boston Marathon bombers identified as Chechen. So I became further interested in terrorism through that experience as well as being a first responder down at 9-11 at Ground Zero. I went down there to help medically uh, with we we had hoped for people that were still alive, but actually it turned out I, I helped mostly other first responders and family members that were having a hard time coping that had somehow gotten down to that zone. So through through those experiences, and also being um, a survivor of a terrorist attack in, in the Second Chechen War, I was uh, poisoned by an FSB agent. All of those things drove me to have a want to have a deeper understanding and appreciation of what motivated these people. Uh, okay, so let's let's start with Chechnya. Um, Chechnya. <laughs> tell us where um, because I thought I had a good idea of where it was and I was a bit off. So tell us where Chechnya is and when you spent some time there. Yes, Chechnya is a part of Russia. It's in the Caucasus Mountains. It's next to Ingushetia, which is another province there. And in Chechnya, most of the people are Muslim. Most of them are farmers. They live a very simple, beautiful life as farmers. And they have been trying to be independent from Russia since Catherine the Great. And often they're portrayed by our our uh, mass media, Hollywood, as well as Russian mass media as terrorists, because they have been trying to break uh, free to be independent. So I was there in 2005, which actually was during the Second Chechen War. So basically, Putin waged war in Chechnya, which, which brought him to power as the president of Russia. And the uh, there's a whole incident called the um, apartment Moscow apartment bombings, which were uh, apartment bombings, residential apartment bombings in seven cities, one in Moscow, where hundreds of people were killed, thousands were injured. And it came out that actually the FSB planted the bombs. And this is in many, many, many um, sources and is also in my book. Um, Alexander Limfentenko, I don't know if you remember him. He died from radioactive poisoning. He was a ex-KGB agent. He came out in his book and said that the KGB planted those bombs. So it was an excuse for Putin to go in and bomb civilians in Chechnya, and hundreds of thousands of people died there. So basically what happened in Chechnya, Putin started in that the first Chechen war was like 1998. Uh, and then he he repeated the same thing in Georgia, in Syria, and now he's doing the same thing in Ukraine. And the, the premise of my book, a lot of it is that when you ignore history, which the genocide in Chechnya was largely ignored by the international media. It, it gets repeated, unfortunately. Let me let me ask you this real fast, though. I want to go back because you said a number of things there. 
And I do recall learning about those apartment bombings. And um, I believe that those those so a way to stay in power, right, is to use the fear of the populace and then say, I'm going to be the strong man and crush uh, the bad people. But what you're saying is it's basically now known that the KGB themselves put those bombs there to give Putin that ability to be that strong man and then, quote unquote, crush the enemies. Is, is that safe to say? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes, that's absolutely right. Very much like the Reichstag Reichstag fire in Nazi Germany. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. so let's talk about how did you get the chance to go over and help in that uh, effort in uh, 2005? So I was um, an endurance runner. I ran ultra marathons and marathons and I have done a lot of work with an international running organization for disabled people. And I went with the head of that organization there. We, we, you have to, you, we were invited. Actually, we were invited and we waited for about five years to finally be able to go in there. And it was all under the auspices of the Russian government. That is the only way that we got in. And as a consequence of that, we were met at the airport. At the time, I didn't know he was an FSB agent, but I pretty quickly figured it out. He he was introduced to me as a sports writer uh, journalist, and he stayed with us the whole time, um, basically shadowing us and monitoring us as it, as it turned out, because the Russian army had surrounded Grozny, which is the capital of Chechnya, and there were I've never seen so many military tanks. I, there were thousands of military tanks that had surrounded Grozny, the capital of Chechnya, and we went had to go through many, many checkpoints just to get into uh, into Chechnya, and then many, many, many more checkpoints to get through um, Grozny as well. And the FSB agent was he was with us the whole time. He stayed with us um, in the house where we were. But, and yeah, so that was, that was the circumstance there. And then, so when did he, you know, kind of join your party? Was it after you'd landed in Russia? Yes. After we landed in left Russia and I actually had to use the ladies room and he told me that I couldn't do it, that we didn't have time. And so then I very cleverly said my male companion who he, he knows very well that he had to use the bathroom so then we could go to the bathroom. So it started off that way. Wait a minute. So you're saying that, excuse me, you said, I need to use the restroom. And he said, we don't have time. And then you said your male companion needed to use the restroom. He said, oh, we have time for that. Yes. Wow. Yes. How about that? Yes. And about how long into his time with you did you kind of really figure out, hey, this is an FSB is what the KGB used to be, right? Exactly. It's right. It's the the, new, mm -hmm. yeah, new KGB FSB. Yes. So how long was it that until you kind of figured out what was going on here? I would say two to three days. I mean, his hostility I picked up on right away. Uh, but I would say two to three days. I, I I knew something was really, really drastically off. Yes. And he was very, very hostile to the Chechens. I mean, it, it there was a seething hostility to the Chechens. I mean, towards me because I wanted to help the Chechens, but in particular towards the Chechens. Okay. And um, I wanted to go back to, because once these bombings happened, uh, there was something that you you gave me a quote or or basically that's quoting Putin as saying, uh, what was that thing that he said uh, when, you know, he said the Chechens, yes, did this. What what did he say to the to he the? He said, "We'll smoke them out, even in the shit house." Excuse my language. So oh, you can curse showing... on here. It's okay. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that um, that he's this tough guy. You know, he's bravado, and he's going to smoke them out, even in the shit house. Quote yeah. unquote. Yeah, yeah, I mean, if anybody ever wants to understand the definition of irony, just look up what a strong man is, and there you have it. Thank you. <laughs> you're, hey, you're welcome. Uh, strongmen are bullshit. Um, okay. Thank you. Yes, of course. So you mentioned, not to bury the lead here, but you were poisoned. Now, how yeah. How long into your trip were you poisoned and how were you poisoned? 
So I'm not, I can't prove how it was poisoned. I think it, think it was in a beer. I, I used to love beer. As a consequence of drinking beer, I developed an allergy to it, but um, mm. from being poisoned. But I believe either it was in the, my beer or in my food. It was about five days into my trip. And ironically, it was right before we were going to many of the refugee camps. So many of the Chechens that were lucky that got out of Groznia were in refugee camps in Ingushetia, which is a neighboring province to Chechnya. So it was around the middle of my trip and I got drastically, drastically sick. I had projectile vomiting. I had projectile diarrhea. I had blood in my vomit. I had high fever. When I got out of bed, I fainted. I couldn't walk. I didn't eat anything. I had been in great shape. I was supposed to do an Ironman. Oh, wow. Um, three months after that. Yeah, I was in great shape. I had like 8% body fat, which actually wasn't good because when you're poisoned, the poison goes into your fat to try to draw it away from your vital organs. And oh, uh, there wasn't much for it to hold on to then. Exactly. Yes. And I knew, I knew right away. I mean, as, as if I was my own emergency room patient that I had been poisoned. Um, he also stole money from me and we brought clothes and shoes for the children's Chechens. And he stole all that as well. Uh, and he stole yeah, I, clothes and shoes from the, the che that were I intended for Chechens who were living in yes. refugee camps. Yes. We had specifically brought them for the children because they had, they had nothing. And he stole that as well. Yeah. He stole everything I had. I was going to give my money to the Chechens. And when I went to go look for my money, it was gone. So it was obvious to me that he, he had he stole it all. Yeah, no, he he was a good he was a good sociopath. I have to say that he was very good sociopath. You hear that, Wade? There are good sociopaths <laughs> out there, man. So now you said that you were poisoned. So did you ever make it to the refugee camps or no? I did. I did eventually. I made sure I went, and I also made sure I made it into Grozny, I, even though I was very sick and it was hard for me even to hold my head up. I did. I did. Yeah, and I helped many of the people there get medical help because that was why I was there. I, you know, Doctors Without Borders had been there and they kidnapped one of the medical doctors and she was killed. So they had left. So there literally were no doctors there at this point, except for, you know, Chechen doctors. It's very similar to what's going on now in, in Gaza, um, what was going on in, in, um, in Chechnya. So there was no medical help for me and I was medical help. Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, in kind of foreshadowing what we're going to talk about later, you know, we Americans, we, we, I, I don't say that in a in a bad way. It just we're often focused on so many different things, and we hear terms like refugee camp, and we understand that that happens, you know, quote unquote, far away. Can you describe to us? Because I don't think many people have been to a refugee camp. What it was like in the refugee camp, what the sense of the people who were there, were they thankful to have a place to live, even if temporary? Or can you just kind of describe that whole uh, environment for us, please? Absolutely. It was so tragic and devastating. So the refugee camp that we visited in Ingushetia Many of the Chechens were staying in abandoned Soviet cars. Um, they had no running water. They had no sanitation. There was no clean water. Infection was rampant. I remember we spoke to the chief of the refugee camp there, and his daughter had developed some type of infection. We got her. We got her help, but people were were sick, dying, dehydrated, infected not enough food, no medical care. And actually, even though it was devastating in Grozny with all the bombing, somehow it seemed more hopeful there. There, there was no sense of hope or a sense of the future in the refugee camps. It was just, it was dismal. It was despair. It was devastating. Oh, and how, how long were you there? I was only there 10 days, 10 days, and it changed my life. Yes. Yes. Um, wow. And so how, 
you were obviously extremely ill from what you feel was a poisoning. How how long did the kind of um, after effects or second order effects of that uh, reverberate in your life? So for many years, for three really, I would say I was in a transient space between life and death. I had pneumonia maybe 150 times. I developed food allergies, which I, I, I hadn't even identified at that time. And then subsequently, I developed GI parasites for about 12 years. I mean, so many that some were unknown to man, the names of them. Oh. And I developed 25 food allergies, which which also changed. So all of these things, I had been the picture of perfect health. I did Ironman and ran ultra marathon, 56 mile races and never got sick. And then I turned into a frail bedridden immunocompromised patient essentially. So I would say it lasted maybe five years very seriously. And then it, it, I was well enough to begin to really research and put the pieces of the puzzle together in terms of what I think the best medical guess I was poisoned with. And a lot of my symptoms were very similar to other people that have exposed. Actually, I was tested on a Rife machine. Um, and What's a, a Rife, Rife machine? The so Rife machine is a holistic type of instrument. It's legal in Germany. It's illegal in America. And basically... Every every bacteria, every living thing has a specific wavelength. So they identify illnesses through wavelengths. And on um, first morning sputum, hair sample in my fingernails, I had man-made anthrax throughout my body. And wow. I, I do think that might have been what he um, poisoned me with or and or I also tested really high for heavy metals. So I'm not sure what it was. And by the time I figured out it was anthrax, I got myself into a, a study at the CDC. And this woman, so there is no blood test for anthrax. You can only test positive for anthrax when you're initially infected. And it's, it's like when you have sepsis. So sepsis is like a blood infection, which is basically what I had. But that was like five years ago. So this woman was trying to create a blood test for people who had been post-infected with anthrax. And she had tested many of the um, post-walk workers who had been infected with anthrax. Oh, But yeah. after like about, I think she said something like eight years, you, you don't, you don't, you no longer seroconvert positive. And I had been too long. So I couldn't prove it at that point. Gotcha. Um, I want to just point out something that you very... <laughs> very humbly said that you'd run 56 mile races for those of you who are uh <clears throat> listening and wondering well how far is that really that's two marathons regular marathons plus 3.6 miles so it's a one marathon oh we're not even halfway done here's another one and then 3.6 more miles that is insane and kudos to you i've run one marathon and uh i thought that was going to be the end of my life <laughs> Which one did you run? Uh, I ran the Chicago Marathon. Nice. Very yeah. nice. So what got you, before we move on, what got you into distance running? So I was always an athlete. I played college and um, high school and and then I, in college, and then I, um, tennis. Did I say tennis? I played tennis in high school and college. And then I played on the qualifying circuit, which is- Oh, wow. Yes, yeah, semi-pro. I was really into it. And I just led a a man in a wheelchair in the in my first marathon, the, the New York City Marathon that I I ran as his guide in 2001 and I just got totally hooked. I I was so inspired not only by him, I mean he was in a regular wheelchair, not a regular he was pushing a regular wheelchair and he pushed it the whole way that's 26.2 miles it was wow he was from jamaica and i was so inspired by him and other people I, then i started training the next year yeah yeah and uh it is a really singular experience obviously and if i i have to imagine that the new york city marathon is also very much a uh positive affirming atmosphere 
where people come out not only to cheer on friends that they know, but just the people who are who are making the attempt uh, to do to do to run a marathon. Is was that your experience in running the New York City Marathon? Absolutely. People with disabilities. There was one man who pushed a regular wheelchair backwards the whole twenty six point two miles. Whoa! Just sense right. Just the sense that. If you can do this, really, if you put your mind to anything, you can do it. I mean, such positive energy and really people coming together and bonding. and it, It's just so much love and positive energy. And it, it's really the best days of my life, the days I, I, I ran mar- the New York City Marathon in particular. And that starts on Staten Island, right? Because it does hit all five yes. boroughs, right? Exactly. The Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Yes. Yes. Um, And then, you know, you another thing that you very calmly said, but I still think is amazing, is that you ran you qualified to run for Boston. And I use the word qualified because I'm no marathon expert, but I know you do have to qualify to run in the Boston Marathon. And if you were to take my time in the Chicago Marathon, I would be not even close to qualifying. Um, And so. When you you were running it in 2013, when the bombing occurred, is that correct? No. So I I no I no. was so I ran I qualified to run Boston my first marathon. I ran New York City and qualified. So I ran wow. Boston 2002. But I was in Boston at a medical conference when the uh, gotcha okay yeah bombings occurred. So okay. yes. Um. Well, those are amazing accomplishments. And I know another thing that you told me, you mentioned obviously at the beginning of this episode that you you work out of Greenwich Village. For those of the people who don't know, um, you know, that's where, uh, that's in lower Manhattan, but not all the way down. And you had told me that when you would run, you would often run near where the World Trade Center was and kind of back up. Is is that right? Kind of that was kind of your your running jaunt. So you would see those yes. towers every day? Yes, that was my lunch break in between seeing patients. I ran down to the World Trade Center and back. It's about a six mile loop. And I realized after after nine eleven that I very much identified with the World Trade Center buildings because they were so resilient. They had been bombed Right earlier underground and withstood that bombing. And it was devastating for me to have them not be there anymore. They really were my running companions. And often I would look um, to the World Trade Center to get my bearings when I walked around Manhattan, figure out if I was going north or south. I've heard that many times specifically about what direction am I going? You just look up and look for, you would look for the World Trade Center, or I guess now yes. the, the Freedom Tower. Um, and then you know, I have a very close friend of mine who she used to run a lot in Chicago and her running companion was the John Hancock building, which is on the North end of the skyline. So for those people who are kind of like, what do you mean? I mean, if you run enough and you look at things, you, you start to have emotional attachments to those, to those, uh, you know, monuments, et cetera. And so not only was, were you in your office when nine 11 occurred that morning? So I w- w- walked to work and saw first patient, and then the rest of the day, none of my patients showed except for one. So I literally was on the street when the first and second tower um, came down, as well as I saw the plane come from behind the south tower and hit it. So I saw literally all of that from the street in front of my building on University Place, which is about a mile, about a mile from the uh, from from the World Trade Center, yeah. And so did you immediately go down there? I didn't because I had patients. I went down the next day. Uh, all yes. my patients canceled because mass transit, everything had been um, stopped. So I, I went down the next day, yes. And I believe that you said um, either the first or second day you were there, you were there for 16 hours? Yes, yes. And what yes. Were you, you said that you ended up helping other first responders as opposed to just because that's who immediately needed the help? Yes. So we went down, I I went down initially, I was given work gloves and we, we just spontaneously formed a great brigade line and we were moving brick and debris, trying to look for survivors. And there were, you know, spires everywhere. There was stacks, 
stories high of debris. There was ash raining down. I don't even remember the color because also I think I was in shock and had a really hard time gaining my bear- bearings down there. Also, I had to pass um, a police um, line there at, at Houston Street. So it was very traumatic. And then eventually we formed spontaneously a um, ad hoc medical unit. And what we wound up or what all of us were were treating were other first responders that either got trapped in the debris or injured, or I treated a, a construction crane worker who was having stress, anxiety disorder, or other family members that were creating some problems because they had spoken to their loved one before the um, buildings went down and they wanted us to go specifically into the building where his loved one was, things such such as that. Um, firemen trying to get them medical help. Yes. Wow. That is and and how many days did were you able to go down and help? So I was down there probably like two to three days. And then I tried to go back down a little bit after that. And then it got very political. So um unfortunately and and there were after that really there weren't people to help that much. There were they had a morgue down there with oh. bodies, but mostly it was, you know, first responders that were down there that then could could more get help. It was when I was there, it was more um, chaos. It was chaos. Yeah. And as somebody who's from New York, New York, obviously 9-11 happened in numerous places, right? It's not just New York, but and tell every year when that anniversary comes we've just had the 22nd anniversary um what what are your feelings uh, about that day and about what it means to you as a new yorker and uh, you know how how new york came back from that so new yorkers are so resilient it it never it never failed to amaze me i remember riding the subway after 911 and i was peering over a nice lady's newspaper reading it and Normally, people in New York just are very, you know, they're myopic, they're focused, they they don't really interact that much. And she smiled at me and she just handed me her newspaper. To me, it was such an amazing feat for how humanity came together. Mm. And when I was down there with other first responders, really, we spiritually bonded together. We really rose above all the death and the destruction and the sickness and the the horrible chaos that was down there and we all came together at as one really it was and and we did it without even communicating we just spontaneously formed a brigade br- brigade line like moving debris and then an ad hoc medical unit and we all worked incredibly well together and just the bravery of the firemen and the policemen Firemen had been down there for like two days, and I remember telling them they all needed to go home to get wrath. They were sleeping in Century Twenty One. Um, it was it was just amazing to me how people were so interconnected and and came together to help to help humanity. And it was such a beautiful comment on how loving and kind and resourceful we all are if if we want to be and. To me, it was the most reassuring event I think I've ever partaken in. It was just, it was really a beautiful thing, a special thing. Even though it was very traumatic walking down in Soho, Soho was like a ghost town. And I remember it was the only time really I processed fear because I tend to be counterphobic. And I was like, is this a good idea to go down there? And other than that, it was just, um, I still have friends that I met on that day. I met. A medical student who was my interpreter. She spoke Spanish. She was a young medical student and she helped communicate with a family member because he only spoke Spanish with me. And I went to her wedding. Um, I'm still friends with her. And then I met a journalist who interviewed me, um, you know, the next day. And I'm still friends with them. It just really, it unified us and brought us above normal ordinary experience it was quite it was quite spectacular i would say 
Yeah, I think spectacular is a really a spectacular, inspiring. Uh, out of such uh, horror can come reminders of of the goodness of life and the goodness of that human beings can be. I, I think that's a wonderful uh, story to take away from such a dark, dark day. Um, so true. Yeah, and so you. Let's get to also. You know, how do I say it? You know, I'm. Uh, somebody who I don't know how this happened, but we learn of these mass shootings more often than we more and more often, it seems like. And it's almost as if we see them and we're horrified by them, but we don't know how to react to them. Uh, I guess I'm speaking more to myself in that, uh, excuse me, of myself in that I see something I can't really comprehend type of things like Uvalde um, or, you know, Sandy Hook or or any mass shooting of any kind. It is it is hard for me to understand the extreme horror and desecration that it does to people, to families, to communities. Um, so what made you as somebody who's worked to help people, whether it be working, you know, at 9-11, whether it be in, be in Chechnya, whether it be uh, working at an ER for uh, for those number of years, what led you to start to study mass shootings um, on your end? So I, I developed an interest in terrorism and mass shootings because it's such a uniquely American epidemic. And some mass shooters are deemed terrorists. It's like there's an overlap. So it's confusing in the literature because there's no universally accepted definition of mass shooters and terrorism, which actually confounds the research. But just, you know, I, I feel like I have an interest in understanding what motivates these people. And what I found was that in in my research, which most most of the literature on mass shooting and terrorism is not done by psychiatrists. It's done by psychologists or um, forensic criminologists or applied um, psychologists. And Dr. Serfolio, sorry to interrupt you, but before you move on, just for somebody who might not know the difference between a psychologist or a psychiatrist, can you just give us kind of a layman's definition or, or, or how they're different? Sure. Um, a psychiatrist is a medical doctor who went to medical school who, who can prescribe medication. So they often will rule out medical illnesses in order to make a psychiatric diagnosis and then to be able to treat it. A psychologist is someone who went to graduate school and focuses more on the psychology-driven causes of mental illness. They don't really focus as much on the organic causes of it. So Great. they can't prescribe medication. Understood. Thank you for, um, you know, clarifying that. Go ahead, please. So I was interested in understanding this because it's, it's such a, it's such a uniquely American epidemic and in other countries where they've had mass shootings, they do common law gun restrictions and the incidence of mass shootings go down like in Canada, England, um, Australia and New Zealand, that all has happened. But in America, we, we have, rampant guns and most a lot of people in America own multiple guns and it's this combination of often people who are marginalized they're ostracized they come from a history of sexual physical abuse they feel shamed and ridiculed and made fun of and Often in our study, we found that 87.5% of them um, suffer from undiagnosed serious axis one, meaning uh, serious psychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, and they don't get uh, treated. They don't get it. Most often, they don't get any treatment. If they get treatment, it's it's not proper treatment, and they get put on the wrong medication, which is a shame. Schizophrenia is easily treated with um, antipsychotics. And in fact, you can get rid of auditory visual hallucinations telling you to kill people, which is was so often seen in the mass shooters that I studied, just by being put on an antipsychotic. So these people are falling through the cracks. Often they're identified by their family or school or the legal system. And then 
there's just no follow up. And it's, it's, we have to do better treating these people. These people deserve to be treated better. They deserve to be respected. They deserve to get the care that they need. And I also should say that many of them uh, had a, so there, there's a perfect storm of all the things I said. So untreated mental illness, they're ostracized, they're marginalized, they have a history of abuse. And then they have a personal crisis. So either losing a job or having a girlfriend break up with them, which which happened both in the main shooter. He lost his job and his girlfriend broke up with him. Yeah, or, the main the state of Maine, just to be clear. Yes, that that was right. as of this record when was was that in September? Maybe it was October. October. I, See, isn't it interesting that we can't even pinpoint when I one know, of the, these so ho- horrors sad. happened? Very anyway. Sad. So yeah, Maine, there was a shooting in Maine, Lewistown, Maine, as I recall. Exactly. Yes. Mm-hmm. And he he was a poster child for really what we studied. He was a middle-aged white man, most of them are. He suffered from to, so reading through the lines again, I have to say I didn't interview him. Um it, this is all through family members in the newspaper who said, you know, his sister said he lost his hearing, he became more paranoid and isolated. And then he was apparently hearing voices telling him to kill and uh, kill his army base in Peekskill, New York, which is actually up here by me in the Hudson Valley. And I, this is, again, reading through the lines. It sounds like they admitted him against his will. And then the police went to his, 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 his family and said, could you please make sure he doesn't, he had, he had access to guns. So he, he was a reservist in the army and he taught people how to fire arms. That was his job. And apparently he was an excellent shot. And they assured the police that they would take away weapons from him and that didn't happen. And then he lost, was fired from his job and uh, his girlfriend broke up with him and he had a break, you know, and this is a guy that, should have was identified, should have had follow up. Often, you know, we're writing a paper now on this, which is if if someone is suicidal or homicidal, they can be treated against their will. And it really is going to take the family to be involved to to mandate that because this is a guy that should have gotten treatment against his will because he could have been helped. And often the the people that we study once sadly, the ones that survive, are in jail and then they get antipsychotic antipsychotic medication in 10 days. They come out of their psychosis. They express remorse. They're horrified at what they did. You know, this isn't the person that they are. They're, they're just psychotic and they're not psychotic anymore. And it, it's just such a shame that we have the tools to treat these people and they're falling through the cracks. And why do you think uh, this is a <laughs> this is a pretty broad question, which obviously there's there's not one answer. But in your expert opinion, or or of, I believe you said you've studied fifty five mass shooters. Um, yes. Why do you think they're falling through the cracks? What what contributes to that? So mental health stigma is such a onerous bear that we have to tackle. People feel ashamed to say they're anxious, they're depressed, they're psychotic where this is medical illness. This is no different than having diabetes and needing insulin or having heart disease and needing heart medication. If your child has has having problems seeing or hearing, we test that in schools. Why aren't we testing people's mental health in school? There's such a stigma in our country and in, in many parts of the world with mental health that we feel ashamed or there's something wrong with us if we have a mental illness and there's nothing wrong with you. This is a condition of being human. It's mm. like having any other medical illness. And we don't, we tend not to talk about it. Often the mass shooters that I studied, family members suppressed family history of schizophrenia, and usually schizophrenia is inherited. So, you know, clinicians know to look for that then more strongly. Or they threaten to send their loved ones to military camp to get rid of their psychoses, or they just didn't want to deal with it. They felt that it was something to hide and not to talk about. And this is really the crux of 
the problem. That and easy access to guns in our country, certainly, but that these people feel ashamed. Some of the mass shooters that I studied also, so these people are very smart. They have very high intelligence and they can hide their psychosis from lawyer, judge, treating doctor. And they felt that their delusional message wouldn't be taken seriously if they admit it to mental illness. That also was a common scenario that I heard. And and unfortunately, these these people are often the the mass shooters are often the smartest people in the room. They have very high IQs. Mm. So, so definitely mental health stigma. I mean, it it's just look. Everybody, what's the what's the, everybody likes to say? Oh, we're having a conversation on mental health, to which I always say, are we? Because you know, I'm not sure that we are. Perhaps we are more than we were in say 1964 or something. Uh, but it, I still feel there's a long way to go. And um, I think you had said to me before too, mass shootings are indications on how healthy our society is. Absolutely. And Absolutely. I t- expand on that a little bit. Tell tell us. And again. 55 mass shooters you've studied. Actually, before uh, go ahead and tell us how you feel that is reflecting on our society and what what you know what your findings are. Yes. So we are as healthy as how many mass shootings we have. If we have a mass shooting, it is an indicator of how sick our society is. If we have one person who's suffering, who's hearing voices telling them to kill other people who can get can get treatment. I mean, you have to fight for treatment, it's true. But there is treatment available to treat that. It's not like the treatment doesn't exist. These people need to be respected and they need to be brought by a loved one to get psychiatric care, immediate urgent psychiatric care, like having a heart attack. You bring a person right away Mm -hmm. to an ER to get medical care. And uh, this is an indicator of how well we're doing. We're all interconnected. And what we do or don't do has ramifications for the rest of the world. I can look to Chechnya and the Second Chechen War and that pretty much the international community largely, not everyone, but largely turned their back on what was happening in Chechnya, even though they knew. And when when you do things like that, it, 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 it wars get repeated. He, Putin did this with impunity in Syria and Georgia, and then the world kind of woke up, at least for a while, in Ukraine. Mm. But these things happen over and over and over again unless you really address it and deal with it. And it's an indicator of how well we're doing or n- not how well we're doing. And what you do or don't do has ramifications. So if you see someone suffering, and if you know that someone is a danger to themselves or someone else, sometimes just reaching out to that person and being kind is is enough in and of itself. And there's a A TED Talk, I Was Almost a Mass Shooter by Aaron Stark, and he talks precisely about that. He was going to be a high school shooter. He planned to go to his school the next day, and his neighbor, he went to say goodbye to his neighbor, and his neighbor saw something was wrong, invited him, and just, just spoke to him as a human being, like one human being to another human being. And just that kindness and love changed his life. That is powerful i had never even heard of that ted talk i just took a note of that actually um and you're exactly right random acts of kindness another thing that i think we hear in day-to-day life uh but there's always what is the i think it's the dalai lama with credited as saying um be kind whenever possible it is always possible something to that I probably am misquoting him. Don't tell him. Okay. Um, (laughs) uh, But look, it's not going to random acts of kindness is not just about stopping horrific things. It's about, you've used the term respect a lot uh, during our conversation and about respecting. This is another human being who is struggling with X, Y, or Z and kindness is the ultimate salve. It, 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 it really goes so far with people. I can, you know, sit here and think about so many different times that people were kind to me, uh, in large ways, i.e. the way that, you know, 
I give him a lot of shit, but the way that my producer Brent is kind to me and in, in helping produce this show, uh, or small ways where people are just hold the door for you on the street or, or any number of things. And it's, it's, it is worthwhile every time it happens. At least that's my opinion. I agree. It can change, it can change your day, even to witness an act of kindness. It's all proven that your immune system is given a boost. It's, it's, it, it, you, you wow. benefit so much just from if you're witnessing an act of kindness or better yet, you're the recipient or the giver of that. And I, I also wanted to say that with, with Chechnya, that's what happened with the Boston Marathon bombers because they identified as Chechen. They were marginalized, ostracized. They lived very much an outsider life. The sisters were found stealing food because they didn't have enough food. They were dislocated before they came to America. And then the older brother was recruited by the CIA to be a moss crawler in uh, the um, in the Muslim, Russian, and uh, well, in all the Muslim communities, but in America, in Chechnya, and Russia. And they promised him a green card. At that point, he was married and had a young daughter. And then a year later, they reneged on this. And this was a man who felt very impotent. He felt his ma- he felt emasculated. And often this is also seen in a lot of terrorists as well, that they feel they have nothing to live for and they feel hopeless and helpless. And it doesn't excuse his behavior, but it puts it in a context that you understand this his back was up against the wall and he was angry. He, they were very angry with America, mm. both him and his brother. Uh, how long, uh, well, actually, let me ask you this. So when you say you study mass shooters, uh, you mentioned that, um, I don't believe, have you ever been a, had a chance to speak with a mass shooter, uh, you know, after this has happened in your, in your studies? So I've tried to speak to mass shooters, but often what happens is most of them, are killed when the ones that are killed are in the in the penal system and they don't want a psychiatrist to talk to them because often they're trying to do it gets the problem is with all of this is that it gets involved with forensic lawyers trying to defend them or prosecute them and it it I I tried I sent I sent letters to the younger brother at Boston Marathon bomber and the even though I wrote a book about terrorism and I told them I went to Chechnya and I published a lot about Chechnya and also my poisoning, they wouldn't let me talk to him, which was understandable. He initially was given life in prison and then he was retried because they said it was um, it wasn't fair trial and then he was put to death. So I, I can understand from a defense lawyer why they wouldn't want to talk to to me. Mm. Um, so, but I've spoken to forensic psychiatrists who have interviewed them and I've, I've also examined their court records, which was tremendous amount of medical information, like probably five or six forensic psychologists, psychiatrists that interviewed them, huge medical workups, you know, CAT scans, MRIs, brain waves, uh, blood studies. The irony is that these people can't get the help before the shooting. But if they survive and then they're in prison, they get a multi-million dollar medical workup, and then it's much easier to make a medical diagnosis. And to me, this is it's not acceptable. These people need help before they become violent. I wonder too, if this speaks to something that I've thought about that I, you know, my sister, while not a doctor, is in the medical profession, and she, you know, about how our healthcare system is not and maybe you feel differently about this, this is just my layman's feeling, is not set up to help with preventative measures, whether it be preventative mental health measures or preventative measures to stop, say, cancer down the road, whatever it may be. Um, I wonder if, if, if that, do you feel like that that issue is also the problem here with mental health is that we're not treating it preventatively well enough? Absolutely, absolutely. These were people that even before they became psychotic, they they were identified as being troubled, as being ostracized. Often as children, they they were they were diagnosed with autism or learning. Most of them had learning disabilities and autism, um, or not many of them as children. 
So absolutely, these are people that were identified before sort of the perfect storm and prophylactically western medicine right it doesn't it doesn't address it at all it it tends to focus on diagnosis and treatment but it instead we need to get these people into support groups and have good relationship with doctors and and then if they develop other symptoms that they're more readily treated because they can trust the relationships that they have have built and this is not happening. Yes, exactly. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, another thing is, even though this happens, again, so often, uh, sickeningly, in a, in a sickening sense, so, so many, myself included, uh, think, well, this happens in other places. Um, but it, it becomes, it's becoming more and more apparent that, no, it happens where it happens. And it's there's not a specific place for this. Uh, it, it, it goes back to, I think, what you were saying in, on our society being uh, Ill, sick, and therefore all of society is, is unfortunately a place where this could occur. Would you, would you say that's true? Absolutely. If, if we have one person who is suffering unnecessarily, even if we ignore that person's suffering, it's going to affect us. And you can see that in the Boston Marathon bombings. You can see that what happened with the three um, Palestinian men that were shot in Vermont. Mm. I mean, people are taking information what's happening in the Middle East and it's getting distorted and people are acting in, in, in hateful ways. And what we do or don't do as a society has ramifications. And when we come together, we can do amazing things and... Yeah, I mean, if if we don't try to all come together and help each other, I think then we're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, and I, I I tend to agree with that. And another really salient point that you made uh, to me when we spoke before was that most people who have mental illness, they are not violent. They're often uh, victims of violence. Yes. So to be clear, we're not saying that all, obviously, I you never have said this, but just to be crystal clear, we're not saying that anybody who suffers from mental health is going to be violent. It's actually pretty rare. Exactly. No, I think that's such an important uh, topic to make clear, which is most people who are mentally ill are not any more violent than the rest of the population. In fact, they're more likely to be victims of violence. So it's not that I'm saying people with mental illness or mass shooters. I, I never said that. That's not what I'm saying. That's not my message. But what we found was that there's a, a subpopulation of people who struggle with mental illness that may become violent mm. with the perfect storm of factors that we found and that they need to be uh, identified and followed up with and given respect and care that they deserve that anyone else would get. Yeah. Human. Uh, yes. Hum yes, exactly. You said at the beginning of this um the importance of understanding history so we don't repeat it. Uh, I, I think un, that has become such a well-known, I guess I'll use the word platitude, um, throughout the ages that I think we now, it's almost like we forget it again, right? We can say, oh, beware of history. You know, if we're not aware of history, it will repeat itself. Um, I believe that there's enough morality in the study of history to to um, really guide human beings to continue to evolve and make better societies. Are you a, a reader of history yourself? Do you enjoy that particular genre of literature? I have. I have. I would say in college, not so much. I was a French major in college, but I think now I, I love following history and being aware of what's going on in the world because it affects all of us. It really right. does. Like what's going on in the Middle East is, affecting all of us. And I would hope that we could respect the sanctity of human life and come to some type of ceasefire where people aren't being murdered and the hostages can be returned and prisoners can be returned. And I do have a faith in in the human potential to do that. I know it's really complicated history there and mm. it's difficult uh, given what's going on right now in the crisis, but it doesn't mean that there isn't hope for this. 
in the future. So definitely, yeah, I, I've I've grown very interested in history and yes, current affairs. Yes, um, I I just think the more and listen, I'm not some sort of history history scholar, uh, but the more anytime I read history, it just no matter what time period it is, okay, it's just like oh look, I'm reading about society now just in different versions of it it's very fascinating and and very telling and i think it is worthwhile and to call out again what you said at the beginning which is that history will repeat itself and we would do better if if we understood a little bit more of history yes and i think a good example of that in the middle east was that uh putin did this in grozny he bombed them and killed hundreds 200,000 so many so many civilians Jesus. And, and the siege of Leningrad is what in World War II, the Germans surrounded Leningrad and starved. They didn't let in any food or water. Something like two million people perished there. And it's it's what Putin did in Aleppo. And now we're repeating this in in the, 2023 in the Middle East. I mean, we're starving. Depriving people of clean water, leaving leaving babies. I read in the news that a nurse had to leave premature babies that were all in in intubated, and when he came back, that they had decomposed. I mean, this is this shouldn't happen to me in today's day and age. We can do better. Like America in, in Israel can do better in my in my mind. Yeah, and I think with we can do better. And I think the 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 just small amount of your expertise and and some of your uh, life experiences show that you have lived uh, and and done so much in order to make sure that we as as a human society are doing better. And and for that, you know, when you reached out originally to be on the show and, and I was just so excited to have you on because I think you're doing such brilliant work um, and not to mention the time that you spent in Chechnya, not to mention your time as a first responder. Um, and I just thank you for all of that work that you're doing and continue to do. And can you please one more time uh, tell us the name of your book and and when people can see it on the shelves or if they can pre-order it? Yeah, I just want to say it's such a pleasure talking with you. It's very inspirational. And it's great that you have this platform to share with other people. It's really important. You're doing great work. The name of thank my you. book, it's true. Is the name of my book is uh, Psychoanalytic and Spiritual Perspectives on Terrorism, Desire for Destruction, and it's out December 22nd, but you can pre-order it now on Amazon. Great. And like I said, um, as you're listening to this, just pull up the show notes. There will be the link to pre-order the book. Um, Dr. Serfolio, thank you so much for your time. And again, thank you so much. Uh, for all of the work that you have done and continue to do in order to help all of us do better. It is very much appreciated. Thank you so much. It was great being with you. Very inspirational. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, as I, I will end this show, as I try to end every sad times with a reminder that there is always room for kindness and grace, no matter the situation and even with ourselves, there is always room for kindness and grace, and we'll see you next time on Sad Times. You've been listening to a fourth-hand join.